And welcome back to Toasting Design. I think what we're going to, I mean, this is number, the last one is number four. We'll call this one 4.5 because we're doing it in one session and it's not quite, I mean, a 40 minute session is what I consider as one full podcast. Uh, so once again, it's the same lot of us, uh, Chavo Shekman, Michael Boer, Tihiro Mangera. And today what we're going to be discussing is the first year design project. Uh, so I'll just briefly take everyone through what it was and what it was about. Uh, I will put a link or a description or something of the sort so that you can read this if I confuse you. But the idea was any student that chose the mechanical project, uh, you had a sled, which was a basically a sliding vehicle of sorts that would go down a slope. At the end of the slope was an obstacle, basically a flat plate. And what had to be designed was a structure that would go at the front of the sled, depending on how you define the front, uh, the front of the structure that would then absorb the impact. The main caveat or, uh, or sort of constraints that were placed in this design was that A, the design had to be completely made out of paper, no glue, no adhesives, no nails, no uh, any other materials, so only paper, only standard A4 paper. And it then had to start, a, so there was a reference line on the vehicle itself uh, that determined the point by which all measurements were made. So this design was, amongst a couple other things, all about reference points and relative distances and understanding of that. So if you re measured from that reference line, your structure had to extend 120 millimeters up front and ahead. Once the design then started to move down the slope, a movement, a compression, a buckling, a crumpling, something had to occur that resulted in the vehicle finishing a certain distance away from the obstacle. So we measured from that reference line. Initially, the structure obviously had to extend to 120 millimeters up front, but it would then have to fundamentally finish Ideally, 105 millimeters, so for a perfect 100%, it would compress or move or something would allow the design to be 15 millimeters shorter, but a minimum distance of at least 5 millimeters and no more than 25 millimeters. And that was all the students were given. There was a couple extra constraints and stuff placed on just the way the design project worked. But what we're going to go through today is how we ourselves would maybe have tackled that and how we ourselves might have actually approached that. Who wants to go first? All right, so it's on the front of the vehicle. The vehicle's moving down. So this is a brick sliding down a frictionless surface and going bang into a wall. Well, it wasn't necessarily frictionless. The students were given how uh, a video basically showing how long the vehicle took unaided without any box structure or and that's the thing, it didn't have to be a box, nothing said it did. Uh, but any structure up front, uh, a video showing how long it took the vehicle to hit that. Uh, so you could calculate friction if you wanted, aerodynamic drag, though that was probably non-existent. Um, that data was then supplied. Well, if we dive into a first year physics book, uh, yep. the, the overall structure is being squashed. Well, that was an interesting point, and it's what at least some of the groups actually kind of identified quite nicely was the, the word squash. If you start thinking squashing, you're thinking springs, or you're thinking crumple zones and things like that. And while this project might have been sort of defined in the outset with the idea of a vehicle um, crumple zone in your car when you hit another vehicle or an obstacle and how it absorbs that impact, wasn't actually about that because the problem wasn't about absorb this amount of energy and this kind of deceleration or anything of the sort. It was start at this distance and shorten that distance effectively. That's all it was. There was nothing about the fact that the design actually had to uh, compress necessarily. Oh, no, no, not the design. Well, had it had to, to permanently deform. Had, by... had to deform, but even then, and, and you've got to be very careful with those words deform because you see it with the students is that when you're googling these things or when you're looking up what kind of ideas can I get when you're looking up in the first year textbook you're looking at deform you're looking at squish you're looking at squash you're looking at those words rather than 
movement. How does one art, how can you have one item move around another item? There, there was nothing to say you couldn't actually just have the whole design just slide back or fall off or what okay, it couldn't fall off. I wasn't allowing that. But it didn't have to you know, all the items didn't have to remain completely fixed to the design necessarily within reason. There are caveats to that. So squash no uh To form, I guess the form we can go with the form fundamentally it's just a nice word I mean, the choice. thing was X long and it had to end up being sure. less than that so yeah. I mean yes I mean Complex. okay we, we, yeah. what yeah. is the ideal shorten distance uh, 15 millimeters shorter than it was okay. so 120 down to 105 now the whole caveat with that was because the design could go down either direction, the frontal extent of the ve or the sort of length to either end from that reference line was actually different. Mm -hmm. And that would then also adjust the way you took which side you chose to be front and back. So this was a brick with two different front ends. Two Why different would you do something like that? Well, some cars reverse and some go forward. <laughs> 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 and just because the idea between this particular project was to identify that there is no one solution and I'm pleased to say that most students I don't think we ever saw really any same idea right there are a lot of similar ideas but there were certainly a lot of there were no identically similar out of 54 groups 56 groups there were no similar nothing where I could say you definitely copied this group um, and that was half based on the fact that the sled had multiple different ways of attaching it, multiple different, well, two different directions you could go down. Um, there were options and there were therefore concepts. All right, so you basically need shapes which uh, would have effectively absorb the energy. I mean, there are some shapes which uh, wouldn't, wouldn't move at all. So you'd, uh, you sure. could make two completely rigid things that, I don't know, just say the one thing fitted on top of the other one and required no load at all to deform it. Exactly. And then you could have a solid brick yeah, of yeah. paper behind it, mm -hmm. rolled up fat like a cigar. So the thing went thud because acceleration yeah. wasn't part of the, the. Um... Exactly. So that's what it kind of came down to was two general approaches to start. One, are you going to have a system that will, in deforming, absorb the load? Or is it having a structure that will absorb the load simply by just being strong enough to not buckle, move anything of the sort, and a very weak, very flexible, or uh, easily deformed structure that doesn't carry the load, it is there simply to extend to that 120. Well, I think with design challenges like that, if you can spot a, a loophole, take it. Yeah, that's definitely the easier way to go. It's the simplest way to do yeah. it. Exactly. Certainly, okay, so there, there was an extra catch to this design, at least for the first year students, was given the complexity with timetabling and groups and how students were over different timetables, the access to the slope, access to testing was far more limited. So what you had to be able to do was actually test your design independently of the vehicle. So in terms of a consideration of those two options, a design that absorbs the load, and deforms by a necessary amount based on how much energy it gets or be strong enough and a little flimsy thing up front. In terms of criteria, one might be there are more options for uh, origami to make springs and things. But the other side of things is that sort of complexity in knowing how much your design must deform because you could equate that to something else. Uh, other than maybe building the entire test of yourself. And I saw one group that actually rebuilt the slopes and a couple had the sleds and stuff. So good on you for that one. Um, I think there'd be a perfect explanation of what we discussed in the previous podcast, which is the sort of lowest complexity or highest level of design. Yeah. And, you know, every design is based on forks in the road and they don't have to be three. They're just, they're just forks. Yes. Blue pull versus red pull always, or tea versus coffee. Um, with this particular thing, let's say I was a, a student and in my group, um, we all stayed in res, didn't have any objects. There's no ways we could afford to try and build anything. 
the only thing that you could do to earn full marks for this is to go for the rock solid thing yeah. with a little bit of deforming because you're going to get the marks and it's the sort of appropriate way to do it because there's no way you could model this thing. Exactly. This is really, really advanced, uh, advanced stuff for the shapes. Um, if, however, you sort of embraced engineering and you found building things with your hands um, quite cool, you could you could make a rudimentary thing using bottle caps or whatever it is to to make make an object that's about the same size, um, and you could then come up with different complicated shapes uh, and sort of discover by calibration. Uh, what what design would work? So you then have those. Now the one thing that then actually turned out to be quite a, a, a sticking point for a number of students, at least during the testing, which happened yesterday, was this design that needed to fit to the vehicle. And you were given the students were given full CAD drawings of, of and all specifications of the both material and dimensions of the sled itself, fitting to it turned out to be something else entirely. Now, it's not necessarily something you come up with. Uh, to a certain degree, the way of attaching, there would be options. There, there were multiple options. But it is a consideration of the, I guess it would kind of be something going along in terms of that table, the complexity levels. In terms of you wanted to make a pin that would go through a hole. That hole is five millimeters in diameter, and you measure your pin to be five point five. That pin does not fit. Mm. All right. So how do you measure that? Well, that then comes down to accuracies and things like that. And I think you could see it with students that you know they they did very careful measurements. I mean, I was quite impressed with some of the students that when they built things, the sort of measurements were still written on the yeah. on the designs. Yeah. And I mean, the manufacturer of these things was was superb. I, I really sort of take my, my hat off to to the first years. Sure. Um, but you could see that, you know, if you measured with your standard ruler and then you sort of, I don't know, used a knife or pair of scissors to sort of carve the holes, just because, you know, CAD said that the two pins, the center points are 32 millimeters apart, when you do that on paper and you cut those little holes and if you don't have the physical thing to actually test fit it, mm. it's not going to fit. That doesn't stop students in third and fourth year from carrying a whole lot of things, which, you know, eight more bolts go into eight more holes. Mm. Um, yeah. You're going to need a 50 pound sledgehammer to do it. <laughs> <clears throat> and and that's, that, that's half of it, really. And it, it's something that's obviously far more difficult to test. We can't have our students in a third year or even a second year necessarily building cars and building hovercraft and building chairlifts. God, can imagine the ethics requirements <laughs> for that. Uh, doing that, building those things to then test and show it then works. And I guess that then comes down to, right, you've got to prove it works. You can't have a test built model as the first years were able to do and uh, prove their design work because that was fundamentally it. It was, did your design deform to 105? Yes. Hit the nail on the head. Good job on you. No, you're supposed to deform from 120 to 105 and you ended up at a final distance of 124. Something went wrong there, evidently. It's the same thing in a third year report. You need to prove it works. You can't just have calculations and say, okay, there, there, there's my answer. Eight goes into eight. That's unfortunately not good enough. All um, right, so if, if we were to do this based on the, um, it, it's not really cheating, it's just using the rules to your advantage. Yeah. Um, what would we do if we were to set, uh, I mean, if we were to make something rigid and then something really 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 soft and squishy on the front so we met the the starting um, distance and we met the displacement constant what would you put okay well you were involved Shaka so Tara what would you put in terms of the rigid thing I mean easiest thing is either roll up some paper super tight or just stack paper um, but you need obviously because there's no glue right so you need to yeah. put a box or something yeah the students were allowed to, to wet the together. paper okay um, Oh, but you could almost do like a paper mache. You could do a paper mache, but no glue, and the paper design had to come and draw. Okay. I um, would just stack stuff, honestly. Yeah. I would probably roll it up for the simple reason that to stack it, you, you, there's a lot of cutting into yeah. little shapes involved. Admittedly, the stack is more reliable yeah. than the, the roll, yeah. and the roll could always unravel, whereas the stack is pretty bulletproof. Mm. And there again, that's the fork in the road. Yeah. Um, if it's a team of four and you're pretty good at working in a group and you've got four pairs of scissors, yeah. well, 
or, 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 or a guillotine, you just, just get, get cracking with that. With a rolling, um, it would require a little bit of practice to work out exactly how to do it. You know, do you fold the paper in half and then roll it, or do you just yeah. roll from one end, do you roll it diagonal and fold it over? And again, there are tons of different forks, but you need to decide at the highest level, what is the benefit of the stacked paper versus the rolled up paper? And in terms of physics, the stacked paper is different to the rolled paper. Yeah. The rolled paper will not deform because there's no air to squash out between the layers. Yeah. The air is in a different direction to the motion. Look, it could buckle. But it then comes Yeah, down okay, to... but I mean, let's no, assume no. we use my brain here. I'm going to make this like a Winston <laughs> Churchill cigar. No, no, I, I get <laughs> And I'm going to cheat. I'm going to embed, embed a piece of steel in the middle that the judges won't fight. <laughs> when I pick it up, it's like, dear God, this is really heavy paper. <laughs> so I think it was super heavy, actually. I think, yeah. <laughs> no, they were heavy, but I mean, yeah. it, it was a, a judgment on that one. But I mean, I think that the difference then comes down to rolling is you've got a axle stress on a, a shaft. The, the stacking of paper is looking at more, you know, you're absorbing load more by distributing the load over a larger surface area. Yes. Um, so you basically get lower stresses with the stacked paper than the... Exactly. The, so the, the you could get, a, you know, if, if the loads happen to be higher, say I were to accelerate or slingshot the vehicle downwards, the shafts might end up becoming actually a less less of a factor or less of a suitable yeah. solution. But I think if we were to compare it on a equivalent cross-sectional area oh, basis, no, no. Um, the, the, the rolled up paper is going to definitely work. Definitely. All right, then let's assume we, we actually built ourselves a little sled thing and started testing it. So now we're going to go for, let's assume there was a point for how lightweight this thing was. Yeah. The rolled up paper is going to lose the stacked paper is also going to lose because it's yeah. just very, very heavy. Uh, what sort of shapes from nature could we use that uh, either sort of bent and fold, you know, folded over themselves like trying to squash a can, you know, deform, deform, deform until it, it went rigid, or else something which basically would um, absorb all the energy, like squash the whole way and then sort of rebound. You know, you think of squashing up a piece of paper in a ball and then throwing it into a waste paper bin because, well, that exam practice problem went wrong <laughs> sure. um, when you squash the paper it it springs back to life yeah a, a little bit um, well okay i mean you you probably don't want to spring back though unless you go further than the yeah so you, and you, unless you figured out a super reliable predictable spring yeah. back but then what i'm thinking of is if we're considering nature what are the ways in which Things that, or what object is moving quickly that needs to come to a stop in a relatively short distance? Me, I'm thinking of, you know, animals landing, with a bird landing in high speed or something like that. So a basically a bent system that's almost a leg, and you design it so that you're, you have a bent thing, so we know it's going to bend, we know it's going to deform, and you basically have a tendon. Oh, like the birds that Bird Russell has. Bird Russell's famous birds, he has, and, and yes, I'm, I might be talking shit for all I know, but you know. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'm thinking something like that, so maybe, maybe there's something that, although I guess that, that springs as well, but in my, I don't, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, it also comes down to what sort of paper skills you've got. I mean, I'm pretty good at folding paper concords. Sure. Uh, other than that, I'm pretty good at writing SP warnings. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I, look, I can tell you, students are getting better and better at rolling paper. The number of years I've run paper things, that paper of Just without quality, some green stuff in it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or something in it. But Although, I mean, there's, there's YouTube. You can, I'm sure there's tens of origami springs. Oh, and that you, you, can you teach saw them in those like designs. Minutes, yeah. Um, or a, let, let's not let paper be, you know, because that's the other thing is you're dealing with paper, so you think origami. Origami might have been something I even used as part of the brief. And then all you're looking at is origami. Mm. While some groups said, no, it, it, it is a material, I'm going to have it be what I need it to be. Yeah. So some students made a rope type equivalent out mm. of the paper. Origami is not going to necessarily have you do that. Yeah. Um, what are some of the other factors that you need to consider dealing with? with paper. I mean, the fact that it behaves differently depending on air humidity levels. 
Well, one of the ones that actually affected a number of students was they needed to, most of them, so there's various protrusions out of the uh, sled itself, and their idea was that it's going to plug on top of it. So they cut a cross shape into, they found the diameter of that perfect thing, they cut a cross shape in it, and they said, okay, cool, you just push that on. And all that happened was that cross was the same diameter or the same width and height as the diameter of the circle. You can't push a circle through that. That's not the way paper deforms, no. um, more specifically around the radius between those two crossed points. So that's something you're going to need to take into account is how, when you're trying to push one item through a piece of paper, how does the paper move and how does it then deform? Because if your design couldn't install on that sled, you can't be tested. Mm. Um, and it then doesn't matter how the hell you're going to deform. And I think, you know, papers, paper's actually a composite. So each yeah. sheet of paper will have slightly different mechanical properties. So if you were to just sit and tear sheets of paper because you're frustrated, um, no two sheets of paper are going to tear exactly the same way. Certainly not. And if you then work with that paper with your hands and you get some, you know, nice sweat in it, um, or the judges have sweaty hands, that paper is then going to behave slightly differently to to how it did. Obviously, it that's not an excuse to any of you that decide that your design failed because we had sweaty <laughs> hands. That's a good racing driver's excuse, though. <sighs> Judge's hands are sweaty. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Mr. Sheckman breathed on the design, that's why it failed. Yeah, exactly. I was laughing so much at your design <laughs> that, that would, no, I might have been laughing at your design, I'll be honest. Uh, but at the same time, then, okay, so then you start to make that decision to have the design tear itself off in a, in a movement, if that becomes an unpredictable nature, mm. you don't choose that. No. And then what, what shapes absorb energy really well? I mean, cylinders are actually really bad. You, know, you put one dent in the side and it's, it, can go it's, it can go in any direction. Yeah. Uh, triangles? Well, yeah. So, yeah, you got triangles. Um, triangles work because the, mm. the thing fails and then sort of moves into itself. Exactly, it implodes. Um, a cylinder sideways is, is quite a good idea. Um, exactly, you align it. Sort of it squashes definitely. from a circle into an oval and eventually goes mm -hmm. flat. A box, a box is quite a bad idea. Unless, you know, because you get those boxes, it's a whole origami uh, open box thing. So you mm -hmm. fold the paper and blow it and it pops out. Uh, in the same way, you basically reverse it so that it oh. folds in on itself on a predictable fold lines. Yeah. Oh, right. But I mean, your standard standard square boxes. On a mega square box, I mean, that's just going yeah. to do it. So, I mean, the, the, the four edges in the direction of motion, um, well, if it's a square, they're all the same size. But for this, most students would have gone for a rectangle. Yeah. In which case, you've got two square sides and two rectangular sides. They've got different properties. Mm. Um, also, there were no designs that were asymmetric, slightly. So you have an inclined slope and you have an inclined angle. So the one side hits the mm -hmm. obstacle up front, deforming, and then you basically have, I don't know whether it equals out or whatever the case is. And I think said it had to be symmetric. In fact, there are a few designs where you have to have symmetry. Even aircraft don't need to be symmetry, symmetrical rather. Cars don't need to be symmetrical. There are horrible side effects to it not being symmetrical, but don't just go along with it without actually at least maybe considering it as an alternative. That whole thinking outside the box, that, that that's, it's... How it's, would the effect, I mean, if we were designing this thing and we knew that we weren't going to be installing it on the on the vehicle, um, obviously I'd, I'd try and make it as kind of foolproof or, or damage tolerant as possible. Yeah. Um, it comes down to how you're planning on attaching it. There would be certain things that would then limit the kind of ideas I would use. Uh, which partly comes into play being able to experiment and see how your, your design is actually plugging into things. A number of students that come forward, where can we find something that is 10 millimeters in diameter? I mean, fundamentally, you've got a whole lot of paper. Roll some paper until it's 10 millimeters in diameter and use that. Remake the sled out of paper. There was an option. I mean, there's nothing to be stopping you doing that. Um, you need to be able to then, so in part, it, it be testing in that regard there, especially for those plugging ones, because the design just crumpled the moment you're trying to put any kind of force on. You don't know what force we're pushing in. You don't know 
how much you know we might decide okay if we push any more we're going to buckle it so we don't want to so we put it in less than you actually need it to be put in i don't know if there's a i, I wouldn't know necessarily other than uh, that to me would be more on the sort of uh when it, when it comes down to detail transcending down to the mid-level there in terms of that mm. it's um and obviously how paper actually works is really complex yeah and it becomes you need to be an expert in uh, chemistry i guess <laughs> to fully understand paper and chaos theory because you fold this one time it doesn't mean it's exactly deforming that way the next time because you happen to have that fold just one millimeter out which means that there's a little bit of protrusion <sighs> And I think, uh, I mean, would you be willing to submit a, a, a sort of build design project to uh, for course marks not having tested it? Happens all the time, but no. No, you test it out and you find ways to test it out. And if, okay, fine, you don't know what energy you're going to be absorbing, then you know you've got a route. Don't worry about the energy. Know that you have a structure that will be so strong, nothing will deform it. And something that will extend over overhead. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the one thing that was weirdly enough, not a lot of groups had. You had a vehicle that had a set height. I can't remember the exact. I think it's about twenty millimeters. But the number of structures that were significantly higher than that, meaning that your center of pressure upon impact was actually above the center of gravity of the vehicle, causing your structure to then bend up over the top of the vehicle. That, I mean, that, that is a fundamental issue, in which case you're deforming in a way that is not maybe in the right direction you want it to be. I think that also demonstrates a sort of lack of understanding of the fact that forces um, are, are directional. And yeah. if your force comes in from the front, you don't want to sort of send it up past the vehicle and then have it do a U-turn in a structure and then come back and then do another U-turn to go into the bumper. Yeah. You literally want to take it into the bumper and then spread it gently in different directions. That's the best way to absorb, absorb energy. Potentially even in this case directly into the main structure. Yeah, because if, if, if the paper box or whatever was actually bigger than the vehicle, all the paper that's stuck around it can't actually transmit the load no. to the vehicle unless it transmits the load through the paper structure. So it's a, the structural efficiency is not good at all. No, you could at the same time have that as to your advantage. So you have your box, which is absolutely solid. Yes. You have above that, extending up your extra 15 millimeters, another structure, which is loosely hanging there. One sheet. One, yeah, one sheet. Yeah. When you then hit that sheet, it's going to have a moment caused because it's above the center of gravity of the vehicle, flips the object up, and then you're at your perfect 15 yeah. millimeters. No one had that one, actually, interestingly enough. There were some ideas that came close. Uh, but most of the ones that involve movement of a system about a rotating point uh, were actually to the deficit of the design overall. I think it's interesting with this, it was more about figuring out what you were actually asking them to do. Because, I mean, there was nothing in there that said it had to absorb the energy. Absolutely. And if you figured that out from the start, your job was way easier. And it comes down to, again, what's the problem? Yeah, what's the the problem? problem isn't I need to absorb impact and allow people to survive a crash. No. It's I need to stop a certain distance. Yep. Do that. Solve that problem. Because if you solve that problem, that changes things. And that means you're tackling the right answers. Or you're getting to the right answers. I think we're going to call it there for a day. Mm. I think it's been a good session. A little bit longer than 20 minutes. I'll see if I can take that down a little bit. Well, thank you very much for listening. Once again, if you've got any suggestions or any ideas, anything else you want us to go through, or if you have any questions, uh, no more questions came in this past week, so nothing for us to really talk about there. Uh, happy to go through those. Yeah, thank you very much.